I'm very excited to introduce our next two speakers who will be uh, in conversation about good living and practice, the case for Buen Vivir uh, or Suma Cause in Ecuador. And I'm sure um, I'll have a chance, you'll all have a chance to hear how that's pronounced properly. So first we have um, Dr. Katerina Richter. Um, who is a lecturer in climate change, politics, and society at the University of Bristol. Her research interests are in decolonial environmental politics and equitable development in times of climate crisis, crises. Katerina specifically focuses her work on degrowth and Buen Vivir, two alternatives to growth-based development from the global north and south, respectively. She's active in the degrowth movement and explores and explores the environmental justice aspects of the global north's de decarbonization strategies and climate mitigation and adaptation projects. Recently, she co-led a research project for the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that provided practical guidance on how to decolonize research, teaching, and partnerships in humanitarian health. And before you take the stage, I'm also going to introduce Luis here. Um, Luis Gonzalez, and I can't pronounce the last one, please, okay, but I'm forgive me, and now I'll have a chance to hear you pronounce it as well, is a Kichwa Saraguro and a current graduate student within the Human Development and Education program at Harvard University. He currently studies education and community experiences of Latinx and transnational Kichwa communities within rural and diasporic spaces. He has a strong personal investment in the recovery of indigenous cultures and languages, diasporic indigenous identity development, the transmission of traditional cultural practices, and the well-being of youth and families. Luis is an alumnus of UW Madison, holding a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and a certificate in Chicano Latino Studies, as well as a recent graduate of Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies MA program here at UW Madison. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Um, and I believe uh, Kat will start. I will. Um, thank you, Essie, for, Essie, for that lovely introduction and thank you all for being here i feel quite humbled um speaking to so many of you and i really look forward to your questions in the end um and i realize you probably have been listening for quite a while um so hopefully um this will be engaging nonetheless so i'm going to start by sharing my screen uh just bear with me one second um and i'll just keep talking and if i should drop off or anything just interrupt me um to let me know i hope i won't Okay, so um, can you see the screen? Yeah, okay, good. So um, we've done that already. Um, so again, um, I'm really pleased to be here and, and thank you so much for being here with me. And I'm also really um, excited about having Luis here with me and, and hearing his comments on my presentation later. So um, yeah, that's really great. Um, as he said all this already, so I'll skip it. Um, I, I work at the University of Bristol, um, which is sort of west of London. And as essie has been saying, my research is looking into how we can all live well, equitably and sustainably within planetary boundaries and taking into account sort of environmental justice and the sort of historical responsibilities that come with kind of, you know, the over consumption of um, the economies, the affluent economies in the in the global north. And to that end, I look at degrowth and when we and my my doctoral work kind of looked at creating a dialogue between these two knowledges, because we've got this really pressing climate crises and we've got these um, excellent responses. And if we want to look at creating sort of equitable knowledges and equitable, equitable um, ways of solving this climate crisis, um, you know, we need to talk to each other. Um, in order to look at what are our respective weak points. So degrowth was kind of, you know, my, my segue into Buen Vivir um, as a way of learning, uh, finding out what we can learn from it. But the presentation today is just going to be on Buen Vivir. Um, but hopefully we can have a conversation around sort of um, critical pedagogy in, in times of climate crisis at the end of all of this. Oh, sorry. My Zoom controls are a little bit in the way sorry everyone there we go so i'll give a brief introduction to ecuador um and buen vivir because i just think that's going to be useful in understanding um well-being and good living what good living in practice means for ecuador um and i'll also talk about the political trajectory of buen vivir so that's 
again, really important to understand because it is about well-being and it is about, you know, what it means to live a good life, but it's also a profoundly political project, um, um, what, you know, which I've found through my research and, and talking to people there. So we'll do all of that before getting to talking about actually what good living in practice means from a Buen Vivir or Suma Causa perspective. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about collective well-being and, and something called effective abundance. Um, okay. So I'll try to keep this brief. Um, you'll all be aware that, you know, we're talking about an um, Andean country in South America. Um, Ecuador's got sort of three main geographical areas, the Pacific coast, the Andean highlands, and then the Amazon rainforest forest in the east of the country, which is a sort of um, biodiversity hotspot. We've got about 18 million people living there. And Ecuador used to be, um, you know, has a history of uh, Spanish colonialism and, and military dictatorships during the 1960s and 70s um, before returning to democracy. And for the indigenous peoples of Ecuador, that meant, um, you know, forced labor on plantations under the Hacienda system until well into the 1960s and, and probably unofficially beyond as well. And I mean, I, I mention this because that's part of, you know, part of the reason when Vivir exists today, because the legacies of colonialism and discrimination are really still felt today. So, you know, what this Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano has called the coloniality of power. So the sort of continued logic of colonialism that continues to shape society, not just in Ecuador, um, but, you know, across the world, arguably, including in the global north that didn't really end with the official kind of, you know, we're, we're independent now politically, um, that sort of didn't end these systems of oppression um, when it comes to the economy and the social realm, gender politics, or the human nature relationships. So when Vivir is really an attempt to kind of exist or re-exist despite and within these oppressive systems. Um, so we got, you know, we've got these internal hierarchies of discrimination, but we also have Ecuador's place in the world economy. So as a sort of supplier of raw materials, especially oil and gas, um, which you know, generates environmental conflicts, but also you know, um, flowers, um, the, the flower export industry is an important player in, in some of the cantons. And all of these issues generate kind of environmental conflicts. The most famous or infamous of which is probably the kind of Texaco oil spill in the 1990s in the Amazon rainforest, uh, which kind of um, spilt more than 30 times the amount that was discharged in the Axon Valdez disaster that was never cleaned up. Um, and Chevron, um, who bought Texaco, are sort of at the moment trying to mitigate and dispute sort of $10 billion damages that they've been ordered to pay by an Ecuadorian court. And, and, and that is ongoing. Um, the other important thing to say is that Ecuador is a plurinational state, um, and I'll get on to really what that means uh, a little bit later with four major ethnic groups. So we've got uh, mestizos who are sort of uh, the largest groups who are of mix mixed heritage between descendants of, of Spanish and other European immigrants and indigenous peoples. Uh, we've got Afro-Ecuadorians who are descendants of enslaved Africans who were forcibly moved by Spanish uh, imperialists or colonists from the early 16th century onwards. Um, and we've got uh, Montubios who are sort of, um, who are a separate and recognized ethnic group um, who live in the sort of rural coastal areas of Ecuador. And then we finally have the indigenous um, nationalities and, and, and um, peoples of Ecuador. And there are 14 different ones, 14 different ones, 14 different nationalities of whom the Quechua groups are, are the largest group. And I purposefully, I mean, it would have been really nice to give you a pie chart or whatever, but I, I purposely didn't do that because um, there are, that's a political sort of decision. And, and according to the Ecuadorian indigenous organizations, at least a third or 25% you know, of the population are indigenous. But in the latest available sort of census that we have, only 7% of people actually identified as indigenous, and that's to do with rural urban migration, discrimination, et cetera. So I leave the here, but the thing to say is that there are very important kind of uh, political and social actor in the country. The umbrella organizations um, uh, make their voice heard, um, for example, in, in 2019, um, they forced the government into temporary exile in Guayaquil by blocking the capital and protest against sort of IMF imposed um, um, fuel subsidies. 
um, or sorry, the, the proposed a tax, uh, a cut in these fuel subsidies. And the political arm of this of the indigenous movement, Pachakutik, is was the largest player in the legislative um, before it was dissolved by the current president, Guillermo Lasso. Um, but that's sort of um, not very important for now, but that's just to say that um, sort of social movements uh, play a big role in Ecuador, including um, environmental movements and especially indigenous movements. To get to when we were, um, so I actually haven't said what it means. So um, when we were in Spanish translates into good living, and it's a sort of Andean Amazonian way of, of looking at and, and talking about and thinking about good living. And it really stems from the uh, Quechua term suma causai, or it can also be sometimes called ai causai, which means life in plenitude or you know life in plenty. And it's based on principles of reciprocity and solidarity with the human and non-human world. And, and I'll I'll get on to sort of what that means for well-being. Um, and, and the other important thing to say is that the right to good living was enshrined in the Ecuadorian constitution in 2008, which, which I'll also get to. And it's really become a sort of umbrella term for various ways of um, practicing um, equilibria or working towards equilibria with the self with community and nature by kind of communities that have have historically been racialized and marginalized and it's a term sort of recognized across latin america so in bolivia we've got a version of that um called living well based on an aymara cosmology um and the term is recognized in guatemala and colombia um but it always means slightly different things so today i'm only talking about the the ecuador version because that was where my research um took place. So I've just got one slide on this. Um, I could, you know, go on for hours, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but this is quite important to understand the sort of, you know, um, way that well-being is conceptualized here uh, from the perspective of Buen Vivir or Suma Causay. So I've already said, you know, um, that this is a term that originates in the indigenous world. And we actually got textual evidence at the moment that shows us that in the beginning of the 20th century, it was used as a pedagogical principle by the indigenous uh, organizations at the time to fight oppression, illiteracy um, and, and poverty. And we can make that link um, that you that, that Suma Kausa is used as a pedagogical principle also um, into the 21st century uh, in 2004 with the founding of the intercultural pluriversity of the indigenous nationalities um, in Quito. And so you might still kind of, you know, well, what does it mean? So the filling of this concept with meaning coincided with the strengthening of the indigenous movements uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. So in the 80s, the kind of indigenous organizations of the Ecuadorian highlands really consol consolidated what Ai Kausai meant for them, again, in the fight against oppression and exploitation. And they sort of based their political struggle on a kind of unique Quechua way of life and socio-political organization. And, and they, they call this Ai Kausai de la Sierra, or the good living of the Andean highlands. And that identity um, is based on close connections to the land within families and also the realm of ancestors, and so they basically took this struggle and formed this system of political organization based on plurinationality and interculturality and, and put this forward as a proposal to the country. And this plurinationality and interculturality are sort of the two central pillars of Suma Causa as a political project. And with you know, uh, plurinationality, we really mean the exercise of collective rights and self-determination by the Ecuadorian indigenous nationalities within the modern nation state, which, you know, um, is presumed to consist of one nation only, um, or one nationality. And then interculturality really refers to the sort of mutual respect and, and equitable relations between the different cultural practices of ethnic, um, of Ecuador's diverse, diverse ethnic groups and nationalities um, that I mentioned before. So then in the 1990s, um, this kind of all took on um, a different pace and a different shape um, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, for example, where um, some anthropologists and also some development institutions worked together with uh, the indigenous 
um, nationalities there to put forward their own proposal um, or their own sort of, I guess, alternative to, at the time, you know, the World Bank sustainable development paradigm that was seen to kind of propagate a certain development model based on economic growth, based on, um, you know, um, trade liberalization, based on extractivism, and that was very much resisted um, in these spaces. So from there, Suma Kausa kind of moved and was disseminated to Andean intellectual and social movement circles and, and sort of entered the public sphere in the early 2000s. And this really, when we think about kind of, you know, the political momentum in Latin America at the time, coincided with a wider struggle for recognizing um, diversity as a useful political uh, strategy. So the left-wing Ecuadorian movement sort of combined their struggles with the indigenous and Afro-descendant movements. Um, and then that, that was sort of part of the wider trends in, in citizenship and changes in political participation that arose in, in Latin America through the so-called pink tide and pink tide government. So there was this wave of um, socialist governments, you know, the fam most famous of which that you're probably all kind of will be familiar with is Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela, but also Nestor Kirchner in Argentina, Lula, um, Ignacio Lula da Silva in, in Brazil, who just took office again, Evo Morales in Bolivia. And all these governments um, benefited from a commodities boom at the time uh, to basically push forward development projects and sort of um, uh, wealth redistribution. And in Ecuador then, the government under Rafael Correa convened a constituent assembly to draft a new constitution based on greater economic you know, control over key resources, but also on sort of based on broadening this citizenship um, model, really. And that culminated in the constitutionalization of Suma Causa as the right to good living in this uh, 2008 new constitution. It was also that, that one was also the first one to grant rights to nature. So uh, really uh, the constitution, so a really huge step towards the kind of, you know, transforming a colonial neoliberal state into a post neoliberal plurinational political entity. So these were you know, incredibly exciting times for left wing um, socialist um, and kind of environmental movements. Um, however, you know, that was these promising, these, you know, these promising political developments were soon to be sort of disappointed uh, because the indigenous territorial and plurinational rights that were also included in the constitution actually came to be, or the, the government, the Korea government subordinated those rights to their own um, extractivist development model, uh, which they pushed through under the guise of Buen Vivir. So there was the certain sort of appropriation on behalf of the government of this discourse of Buen Vivir um, that was incorporated as a sort of development principle into the various planning documents by the Ecuadorian states, um, by the Ecuadorian state. But the problem was that um, that basically pushed through extractivist projects that very much um, uh, were in tension with the rights of nature that were also enshrined in the constitution. And that, of course, the indigenous movement movements who, you know, whose people were living on these territories where suddenly oil and gas and, and mineral mining concessions were granted, um, were living and where they were at risk of being ex expelled from uh, together with their kind of, you know, cultural bases and, and knowledge systems and etc. So the Korea government basically turned on its supporters and kind of systematically weakened indigenous environmental and, and other social movements. Um, in, you know, and, and there was basically no dissent available to this extraction based growth model. Right? Um, and, and they actually they closed the pluriversity of Amautai Wasi in, in 2014. They weakened bilingual education. Um, and, you know, they sort of granted mining concessions in, in indigenous territories without prior free, you know, um, an informed consent and, and consultation. So, and this was a very long way of saying um, that we basically have a sort of bifurcated meaning of Buen Vivir now. On, on the one hand, it's a sort of government discourse and tool for domination that says, you know, well, this is, this is what it means to live the good life uh, from the state's perspective, because we're bringing economic growth, we're bringing poverty alleviation, even if it comes at the cost of 
you know, territorial integrity and plurinationality and the rights of nature. Uh, so this is on the one hand, the sort of state version, and on the other hand, Summa Kausai still remains a grassroots decolonial project of the Ecuadorian indigenous and, and sometimes non-indigenous um, populations. And it's a sort of, you know, political platform that continues to sort of struggle towards self-governance, equality, and wealth redistribution. So it really is a sort of a counter proposal to this idea that well-being, you know, is or can be understood in terms of GDP growth, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, growth-based development that prioritizes industrialization over territorial integrity, self-governance, and and rights of nature. But I think the last two slides now will talk about what when Vivir or Summa Causa means for the people that I've interviewed. So I'm not gonna be talking about the when Vivir of the, of the state. So, you know, the sort of tool for domination and then the kind of appropriated government discourse, but I'll talk about Summa Causa, the, um, you know, um, grassroots decolonial version, I guess, and, and political project of that. And the, the sort of, what's on these last two slides and what I'll be talking about in terms of well-being and good living is really based on a piece of qualitative research I carried out in Ecuador in, in early 2020, so just before the pandemic hit or as the pandemic hit. Um, and I, I went to Ecuador because there's a lot of, or there were a lot of studies on, on what Buen Vivir is and sort of polemically and, and theoretically, but no one had actually gone and asked, <laughs> you know, people, people in Ecuador what Buen Vivir meant to them and there is now you know some there's now some literature available on it but at the time there wasn't um and you know as with any kind of research that involves or you know that yeah that involves indigenous peoples there's always this sort of you know baggage of colonial past um and that's difficult to deal with and that that needs to be addressed and, and sort of um, reflected on, um, you know, me going as a kind of white privileged researcher from the global north, um, talking to, you know, indigenous peoples will always create some sort of, you know, the knowledge will always be created under these asymmetrical kind of power relations or power imbal imbalance. And so to kind of avoid that or counteract that, I made sure to kind of, you know, engage with and, and read indigenous scholarship and before going and, and, and engaging with indigenous practice while I'm there. But also the other thing to say is that I'm not trying to really kind of um, generalize here. So I'm, I'll let the interviews, I'll try to let them speak for themselves and I'm not trying to universalize anything that, you know, and I'm saying that this is all applicable to all the indigenous peoples in Ecuador. Um, I'm making, you know, comments about, you know, the, the communities and the people that I've spoken to, um, and they will be limited, but I hope, you know, they're still interesting um, and, and have something to say about kind of what it means, or what good living means. And so I talked to kind of community members, social leaders, politicians, and I think the thing that came out the most was that for them, Summa Causa is really about living in harmony with oneself, one's community, and, and with Mother Nature. So in a nutshell, that is what good living means. And living in harmony, maybe that's a little bit too fussy now. Um, I could, you know, we could translate that as a sort of meaning to live in a caring and reciprocal way with oneself and with others. And, and I think you can sort of, that can be described or is often described by uh, anthropologists as a kind of relational worldview. Um, and I guess that that's quite central to this idea of good living here too. So Relational worldviews are very different from our sort of um, Cartesian Western understanding of the world where we're apart from others, they have nothing to do with us, uh, our mind is body, uh, our mind is separate from our body, nature is a sort of resource out there that we can use at will and at leisure to sort of improve our own kind of condition. Um, and this is, you know, I mean, Carolyn Merchant has a really interesting book about the death of nature, about how early capitalism and the scientific revolution sort of interacted to almost kind of, you know, kill this pre-capitalist European image of a female nurturing nature. Um, so the relational worldviews that I've kind of encountered in Ecuador were very different from that. 
um, and they consider that the social world is actually contingent on and produced by the interaction between the human and the non-human world. And they're not really conceived of sort of separate entities, right? And, and then the human, that the human is embedded into the non-human world. And I guess in a sort of, from an anthropological perspective, these worldviews uh, are put into practice by certain world-making practices. So the, the everyday rituals, behaviors that make this way of being, that, that, that put this way of being into, into the world. And what I'm saying here, what my argument is that these world-making practices of Wen Vivir or Summa Kausai, and I'm gonna detail a few of them in a second, um, make human well-being contingent or couple human well-being to ecological sustainability and spiritual well-being. So that's, I think, the, the important thing here that human well-being is intricately connected to what we call ecological sustainability and, and also maybe spiritual well-being. Um, in the Quechua language, that would be maybe well-being is contingent on these equilibria, right, between the ecological, the material and the spiritual. Um, and that is produced by acts of solidarity and reciprocity between the human and the non-human world. And I'm going to talk about a few of them now before um, uh, coming to a close. So um, one of these acts of reciprocity and solidarity, um, I think, or a few, I think actually many of them were a way of kind of keeping Pachamama or the sort of Mother Earth figure in a kind of ongoing awareness and affection. So I noticed then that when we were talking over a fire, we were often offered sort of a kind of ointment uh, made out of herbs and plants that were grown by the speaker and sort of, you know, using agroecological farming. And to me, sort of recalling nature and, you know, some of those sort of uh, fruits of nature kind of had this effect of reminding us sitting around the fire that we are connected with nature. And then the other thing I observed is people when, you know, people drinking alcohol, they would spill a little bit of whatever beverage they had um, on the ground before they drank it as a sort of offering to Mother Earth. Um, and I think this produces this care and affection for Mother Earth in rural agricultural dependent communities. But it also meant that, you know, Pachamama isn't really like a, a symbol of fertility or something, but it's actually, you know, she's a living being that, you know, you need to have good relationships with um, and that, you know, acts as a kind of normative restraint to resource extraction. Um, in the picture there, you can see Ilda. Uh, she was uh, the uh, chair of the cantonal women's movement um, in, in, for agroecology. And when we visited her, she said she um, plants uh, particular trees to attract certain types of birds and in sort of general dots or vegetable patches with trees so that in her own words, the birds would have to eat as well. And I think this is really interesting because, you know, of course, the birds then might fertilize the vegetables. Uh, they provide, um, you know, the, the, the trees provide hail cover or rain cover for the crops. And, you know, that's that's the argument that, that agroecologists make that, you know, you integrate natural solutions to improve yield compared to monocrop cultures. But I think Ilda's relationship in that sense with nature goes beyond that and actually, you know, produces well-being for her and her children on a material plane. You know, they have to eat and they can sell their produce in the market because they increase their yield. But also on this kind of spiritual spiritual plane where she maintains or produces these equilibria with the non-human world via, you know, planting trees that aren't, you know, maybe of particular value to her, but to those birds, for example. And so I think it's maybe key to understand that balancing those relationships between the human and the non-human world satisfies basic needs in that sense, but also generates material and, and spiritual well-being um, in the people practicing these, um, uh, these, these acts of solidarity and, and reciprocity. And you'll be pleased to know that this is my last slide. Um, so, you know, the, the people that I've observed doing that, obviously, you know, they were from rural communities, you know, you could say, well, this is a utilitarian kind of behavior, but I think it's important to also bring another example where agroecological production 
you know, is actually not the norm and sometimes is met with resistance from within or outside communities. Um, so in the picture, you can see some associates of the Agroecological Women's Association of Sumat Mikuna, which means excellent food, in El Tambo and Kanyar in the south of Ecuador. And they actually set up the association because they were being boycotted at local markets for selling organic produce. Um, so, you know, they succeeded in by, you know, um, creating this, this association, uh, kind of being able to sell their produce, but also, you know, their, their fruits and their vegetables are smaller, they're more costly because, you know, they're, you know, less competitive when you compare produce grown with agrochemicals. But what they said to me is that they didn't mind because their, their own and their children's health is actually intimately, you know, and, and their well-being, so to say, uh, is intimately collect, connected to the quality of, of the topsoils that are under their care, so of the, the soils where, where their food is grown. So again, sort of linking well-being to ecological sustainability, and, and you know, that can have kind of, you know, huge kind of lessons for us, For and, and, and I, that, I can get onto that in a minute. So now they sell their quinoa and amaranth bars at local schools, and they also have you know, sales and, and mutual exchange networks that stretch actually across the southern provinces and, and up to the coast as well. And for them, the other thing about sort of what when Vivio means is to recover those ancestral seas like you know and amaranths that aren't grown much anymore, to participate in you know indigenous celebrations such as the carnival proce procession pictured there, to you know wear indigenous clo clothing and all of that contributes to this kind of overall sense of identity but also well-being. Um, I know I realize I'm honing in a little bit on the sort of human nature relationship by you know by the fact that, that that's what I do in my own work and there are some other aspects but I think this is certainly a very interesting one. So my argument is that you know, when Viviera Sumacausa mobilizes effective abundance, um, and so sort of an abundance of feelings, because this sort of these reci reciprocal relationships between the human and the non-human world don't just sort of generate and redistribute resources, so, you know, growing food, but they generate feelings and the sense of collective well-being, and this kind of can pose effective limits to harmful production. Um, so being anchored in nature, in one's community and spiritual structures doesn't just produce economic benefits, but also, you know, psychological and, and collective well-being. And so I guess to conclude, I found that, you know, well-being is framed in both material and spiritual terms, and it is really contingent on reciprocal and solidaric relationships within the family, within a community, and with the non-human world. Um, and, you know, these kind of offerings to Pachamama, the ritualistic use of herbal ointments. And I think this, this multi-species care and agroecological production um, is really, um, really kind of, um, uh, I guess, illustrative of the fact that, you know, within the context of Buen Vivir, well-being depends on these ecological, spiritual, and material equilibria. And I think I know, you know, um, the, in terms of thinking about who I'm speaking to here in terms of pedagogy, the idea of multi-species care can become really important. You know, we're facing a climate crisis and we have to sort of, you know, integrate this in our teaching and in our thinking. And I guess based on my research and, and also that of, of, of others, it's, you know, there's something about our worldview and the way, the way we relate to the living world that drives this kind of, you know, endless uh, growth and consumption model. Um, so in terms of pedagogy going forward, we kind of need to find ways, I guess, to, you know, transform our ways of relating to nature. And, and you know, that that's for me a kind of huge lesson we can learn in, in terms of well-being um, from Ben Buen Vivir. So the kind of connection and, and I guess very logical but intimate and spiritual connection between human well-being and, and ecological sustainability. Um, I'll really leave it here now so <laughs> I really have to. Um, I know that Luis is now going to, um, so we're not yet going to questions, uh, I know that Luis is now um, giving us uh, his thoughts on that but thank you so much for now and, and I look forward to coming back to you um, in the Q&A.
Um, well, I, I, my apologies. I thought I had somebody else to talk, but thank you so much, uh, Katarina, for your comments uh, there. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Gonzalez Quispe. I'm currently a graduate student here at Harvard, but I'm very happy to be back at UW virtually, at least. Uh, it's definitely my home, and I miss my home very much. Um, so with that said, uh, I deeply enjoyed um, Dr. Richter's uh, presentation here today, especially regarding Summa Causae, um, as uh, she was just presenting here today. Um, the Summa Causae, in, in essence, is a very integral part of indigenous Andean cosmovision. Um, and it, it is basically a way of one sees how one connects with nature and, and, and in a sense too, how one connects with the deity or their way of professing life. Now, unfortunately, as how uh, Catherine was mentioning too, during the period, the, like the early 2000s to the late 2000s, that became to be culturally appropriated through the government. Um, and that unfortunately has been, um, has manipulated the way of how that has, the message of the Summa Causae has been flowed through communities and even through families. Um, so the perception of how one sees in this case, land, or how they see themselves as family and unity has also unfortunately started to disintegrate over time. Um, and obviously adding the fact to of migration, of globalization, and trans uh, migration has have been an effect into how this specific cosmic vision has been played and seen um, and professed. Um, however, um, I would also argue that since COVID, actually, um, the the essence of the Summa Causa has actually been greater and has started to recuperate some of its integral parts, such as, such as the relationship between nature um, and well-being. For example, um, one of the ways of which many indigenous peoples uh, during the time of COVID-19 started to uh, seek health or, or, or well-being during, during the time was uh, going back to traditional medicine, going back to uh, medicines that perhaps back in the day they wouldn't see um, due to perhaps uh, social or westernized perceptions of health and perhaps dissuading them away from the from traditional medicines and how they view that, they were view back those medicines as an integral part of how they can recuperate through this pandemic. Unfortunately, that due to, like I mentioned before, the globalization and uh, Western perceptions of life have manipulated the way of how Summa Causa has been played out. But nevertheless, um, this progression in the recent times has also helped families recuperate that sort of vision of how Summa Causa can be played out, how Summa Causa can be practiced, not just within families, but also within community. I will note that given my own work and experience working with families in, in Ecuador, um, and, and it also depends, I guess, in which region and which uh, community you speak with. It's, unfortunately, the Summa Causa as an essence has got a bad taste because of this specific um, uh, cultural appropriation by the government. So concepts such as Laminga or Randi Randi which is a concept of reciprocity as well, have been starting to come up more within the way of life. But that's not to say that that takes away the significance of the essence of Summa Causa. And Summa Causa, as uh, Dr. Richter was, Richter was mentioning, um, is the way of how one you know, uh, connects with nature, connects with how the well-being of families unite and go forth, and how uh, communities and also pueblos in itself can go forth and progress against capitalistic ways of life. I will say that the practice of the Summa Causa, for example, has been an integral way of how communities now in this present time are standing firm against extractivistic uh, activities happening within the Ecuadorian sphere, um, especially in this case in Saraguro. Um, there has been, uh, I will say, a continuous uh, fight for the protection of Fierro Urco, one of the specific um, well, integral area, uh, protected areas, at least how we see a protected areas of nature, that is also a fundamental source of water for many of the communities that exist within that region. And unfortunately, due to um, extractivistic uh, activities uh, supported by the government, that's been at risk to being uh, taken apart uh, and used for mining um, operations. Uh, what isn't what isn't seen by the governments, but what is seen through the community in this case is the essence of the significance of this specific area is part and integral for the Summa Causa to prosper. In this case, 
for well living, you need also the environment to be sustained and be well as well. Just how Dr. Rickner was mentioning, um, Earth needs to be in a well state in order for the well being of the communities to also prosper as well. If there's no equilibrium between one or the other, then there's no equilibrium between the way of life of how indigenous peoples live. And so that is one of the main reasons that perhaps from a Westernized perspective, one doesn't see, well, why do indigenous peoples fight for their lands? Well, there is, it doesn't really depend not so much on the actual, you know, need for recovering and for protecting these lands that are full of diversity and biodiversity, but also means the perhaps detrimental effect on the well-being of the communities that depend on the, in this case, traditional medicine that would come from there. Um, the spirituality, the significance of the spirituality of the peoples that live there, and also in this case too, the equilibrium, the well-being, and the health of the people that live within those areas that and which are being impacted by these movements. And so, the Suma Kausen itself, yes, in a sense, has evolved over time, perhaps in in ways that many communities may not have seen, um, and and has also been input through you know, the Western perspectives that have come and perhaps culturally appropriated this uh, way of life. Uh, but additionally to given, you know, the recent pandemics as well have started to reinforce the way of how communities can prosper um, with equilibrium, with the environment and also with um, the deities. Um, I will say though that going forward, I think as uh, Dr. Rick, uh, Richter was mentioning, um, there definitely needs to be further input from indigenous peoples of how that philosophy can be played going forward. Um, I think that within governments currently, uh, that way of life, uh, how um, she was mentioning, it is just not seen at this moment. And, and further and further, it's gonna be culturally appropriated further and more and more. And, and in a way, I, know, I understand that this talk wasn't about from you know, a government perspective, but it does in a way still affect of how families in this case go on and go forth about seeing and perceiving their, um, both the relationship with their, uh, the land and also with their family as a whole. And so uh, to finish off here, um, I will say that in an essence, the communities of, of Ecuador, in this case of indigenous uh, families in itself, the causal vision of Suma Causa is an important integral part of how people view and how people can prosper going forward. Um, however, it is important to also be wary of the potential cultural appropriation that may come into the essence of the Summa Causa. Um, but nevertheless, the essence and the pillars that are part of the integral causal vision of Summa Causa still need to be respected, which in this case is the perception and view of living well with both the land and also with oneself. Uh, because it, one or the other being not with Nickelodeon will eventually be the demise of indigenous peoples. Thank you. Wow, I'm I'm uh, I'm getting a lot out of both of your talks here, and it's it's very impactful and and so incredibly relevant to to life on Earth these days. And I think more and more folks are seeing the how it's quite impossible to be happy uh, all on your own if everything else around us is kind of not going to survive. Um, but without going too much into that, I'd like to invite everyone um, to either ask, put your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and to start us off, um, I want to share something along with a question of my own. Uh, the other day I was uh, reading the book, um, The Myth of Normal by Gabor Mate, if, that is, if anyone's heard of that. And I just happened to come across a section about happiness and colonization, very much relevant to this talk. Um, and he said that uh, the word pishtako is a word, is a Quechua word used to describe, and I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, but it was a Quechua word to describe um, the Spanish colonizer and sort of like the greed of the Westerner in a sense in the colonization. And I'm just curious if, if uh, Katerina or Luis has, have you, do you, have you heard of that word? Does it mean anything to you? But I thought it was a good case for sort of showing the difference, the different values around happiness and well-being just in that one word. You want to take that one, Louis? Um, well, actually, I will. I will be very honest. Um, I have heard it in other means. Uh, I haven't heard it from that specific side of way as far as pishtaco. Um, as far as like pishtaco in the southern Andes region, it's not very much used. I will mention. 
Um, so perhaps maybe my lack of knowledge there might be might be off. I think more so it's more morally used in Peruvian uh, cosmovisions. I think Dr. Ritter, you might have a little bit more to say in that respect. No, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't consider my uh, to have more expertise than you on this, but I think um, I, it's a yeah, I think it's a more sort of dramatized um, kind of way of 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 maybe personifying greed or um, kind of you know um, devilish behavior in a in a sense. But I also am not sure whether contemporary whether it's still used contemporarily. Um, and I would also agree. I've only heard it in the in the in the Peruvian context, so I'm I'm really also not sure how how that plays in in, in Ecuador, for example. No worries. Um, and folks, I still encourage anyone who has a question to put it in the chat or raise their hand. Um, I really like what you said, Luis. Really, both of you have mentioned this sort of uh, the great values of Sumacose, but also how it's uh, appropriated. And I'm curious if you could give us sort of us, the audience, help in distinguishing between when it's culturally appropriate and when it isn't, and kind of clarifying sort of how do we know if if I go tell my friends about this, how do I know if I'm sort of representing it correctly? Um, and if I see it in the news, how can I distinguish between the appropriation or not? both from the Ecuadorian government and frankly, anywhere else it might pop up. Do you want to start again, Luis, or do you want me to go? Um, how do you prefer? Absolutely, you can go first. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks, Essie. That's also a really good question. I think um, the main issue with the sort of government version of Buen Vivir is that, you know, it was kind of, plastered all over these kind of development plans. So these very kind of technical planning documents of the kind of, you know, development ministry um, and, and planning ministry in, in Ecuador. And they kind of presented the state as a good friend to these communities where this said development was going to take place, right? That um, the state was there to kind of facilitate their buen vivir, as it were, their good living, their good life. Um, and that would you know, come with the extractive activities that would be going on, but there would be payoffs in the sense that, you know, the material standards of living would be improved um, and, you know, um, more income per capita would be had and, and all of that. And I think it's kind of selling a version or a, a vision of, of good life and good living that isn't grounded in these indigenous worldviews at all, because, you know, as, as Lewis was saying, you know, we uh, the resistance to extractivism is based on not just the fact that, you know, we, we need these ecosystem services from a kind of Western utilitarian perspective, but they're, you know, the, the integrity of these territories is really vital and important to the kind of, you know, spiritual well-being and to the um, kind of uh, communal aspect of life. So, um, I think if someone, you know, if 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 someone says, well, when Vivir is about uh, economic growth and <laughs> and it's about um, you know material uh, living standards, then then I think that that would be a bit of an issue. And and maybe Luis can talk more about you know when it's when it's sort of um, appropriated or or not. But I also think that um, the um, sorry that when uh when it isn't or when we try to speak about the genuine kind of version that we don't actually see this very much and especially not in the current moment in the, the current moment, political moment in ecuador that we don't see this very much popping up in the kind of um discourse anymore as that genuine kind of grassroots version because that grassroots version comes with demands for plurinationality so um kind of keeping up the political right to autonomy and self-governance that the indigenous nationalities have and that is established in the new 2008 constitution and that is being violated by these various mining concessions amongst others in in Saraguro and the south of of Ecuador um like Luis has been saying so I think um it's a kind of so so other some other practitioners or, or thinkers have talked about when we were as a territorial practice. And there's lots of research in Kayamba, which is to the north of Quito, where 
actually subjective well-being over a period of intervention increased um, without the per capita income increasing at the same time. So, um, and that was achieved by um, taking care of nature in a collective way. So Luis mentioned Minga. So these are the sort of um, almost like a, in, in Kayamba, they did almost like a public private partnership. So in the UK, uh, public public partnership. So in the UK, and I'm sure in the US, you know much about the sort of public private partnerships for building hospitals or whatever. But there, the idea was that the state didn't have many resources um, to implement public works, but um, that they could pro provide the technical expertise and the actual materials and that the public would come and do this work collectively, whether that's tree planting or restoring um, irrigation channels in the paramos um, in, in, the, in the moors. Um, and, you know, all sorts of other kind of intercultural activities and exchange. So, you know, there is evidence from Ecuador as well, you know, that well-being can be improved and subjective well-being reported well-being can be improved upon by recovering you know collective well-being by taking care of nature by investing into bilingual education and i think that goes more to the core of kind of summa causa and and i know sorry i've, I've taken a long time again to talk uh louise um yeah sorry <laughs> no that, that that's good um and yeah just to add to that um so the the way of how I guess the end of a way to respond about how do we know which which is appropriate and which is not. Um, from the Ecuadorian standpoint, uh, I guess there is already within indigenous peoples a sort of uh, distrust of the government <laughs> right now um, in regards to how you know things are appropriated and how things are used, at least uh, how indigenous knowledge and philosophies are being used. Um, and so there is in a sense already a knowing of when, which one thing is appropriate or not, but perhaps from an outside perspective when what is appropriate or what isn't, I think the best mechanism or way to go about it is, you know, talking with indigenous people. Uh, I think that's a very easily and simple thing to do. Um, unfortunately, right now, you know, one of the things that that we we go forth in academia, and perhaps one of the things that um, that we may have problems with still is trusting academia more than the folks that you know academia knowledge is based off from. Um, and so, talking with indigenous peoples, with its leaders, um, is and, and reading from indigenous philosophy is very important to understand. And also, in a way, help you differentiate what is appropriate and what isn't at this time, um, because going forward, uh, or if we want to have that that way of, of you know, checking when things are appropriate or when things aren't, uh, we'll have things such as like, for example, the appropriation of Summa Causa within the administration of Correa. Um, and uh, that, and it's not to say, you know, wrong against this government, but at the same time, it, it's an easy way to see how the, the way of the movement that they go about the Summa Causa contradicts the actual way that they went about, for example, uh, the Yasuni ITT initiative, how that was dismantled, uh, the persecution or prosecution of indigenous peoples, how that was, you know, uh, fomented during this time that the philosophy of Summa Causa was professed. So, you know, going about, to answer your question again, you're going about and, you know, reading and, and connecting with indigenous peoples is a very important thing to do in order to differentiate what is appropriate and what is. What I'm hearing is check your sources, know who's speaking when you, when you, when you quote someone and, and uh, yeah, know who you're listening to when you describe when Vivir and Summa Causa. Um, thank you for that. So I was about to say there are no questions, but maybe there is one moment. Let's see. Looks like Luis may have comprehended the question faster than me. Is this something you'd like to respond to? Um, so uh, yes, I, well, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for your message. Um, I actually do research with indigenous peoples in rural contexts uh, in Wisconsin, actually. So uh, your your uh, your desire to do this is very much um, very much applauded. So I thank you for doing that. Um, as far as like what um, what resources you could use to incorporate indigenous cultures, Pachamama environment, dependency in the healthy Amazon. Um, I would look um, 
Well, at least here at UW-Madison, I would definitely uh, connect with Armando Mundulema, who actually is one, uh, one of the key, the key uh, teacher professor here at UW-Madison, but also he does a lot of work when it comes to um, Suma uh, Causa at WMVV as well. Um, and also when it comes to indigenous uh, knowledges and cultures from yeah, from Ecuador specifically. Um, so I would go forth and, and, and look into that as well. Um, additionally, uh, what I would use, it, I guess it really depends also um, the, the level, the skill level, if it's gonna be in Spanish or in English, um, but I would also look into resources. Um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting a name here, but let, let me look. If you could share me your email, I would be more than happy to send you some stuff your way so that I can help you forward with, with that material. It might be just a little bit extensive right now. Uh, but yes, if you could share me your email, I'll be more than happy to, to share all that information with you. And also, we'll be sharing the resources um, that we have from this from this workshop today on our website and via email. So if Luis, if you I forget whether or not you said anything, but if you think of anything and you want to share it with everyone, feel free to send it my way and we'll make sure to disseminate it. Yeah, and, and I think, sorry, Laura, yeah, um, yeah, awesome that you're doing that. It sounds really, really exciting, actually. Um, I, I did send some stuff as well, but I think really interesting kind of, um, there's lots of resources on, on rights of nature, um, in specifically in Ecuador on and on the the first tribunal, which is a sort of mock kind of judicial court for the um, rights of nature was held in Quito and presided over by Vandana Shiva. So I think um, there's lots of stuff online on that, that might, um, because so my my participants and or the people that I've interviewed were basically saying, well, the idea that nature has rights that's come from the indigenous movement that's come from us and you know we've we've you know included this in in the constitution and it's been groundbreaking when it came out and of course now there's all this sort of you know tensions around that um, and how it interacts and conflicts with development um but yeah i think um that that would be really that might be interesting to look at but yeah i i, I we can yeah share share um stuff afterwards as well, Luis and Katarina, thank you both so much. I personally learned a lot from this and I, and I still have more questions and, and I'm very excited to keep looking further into this topic. So thank you for your time today.